This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidoui Yuat. It's Thursday, November 12th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VUE headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in The Hague, where a former Rwandan tea and coffee tycoon charged with five counts of genocide had a not guilty plea entered for him in a United Nations court. David Doyle has the details. A plea of not guilty was registered for Rwandan genocide suspect Felician Kabuga at a UN court on Wednesday. Though the man accused of financing militias that killed hundreds of thousands of Tutsis and moderate Hutus remained silent throughout. Who would be compelled to follow his orders? The 85-year-old appeared frail and did not respond to judges' questions. And when asked to enter a plea, his lawyer requested Judge Ian Bonamy to consider Kabuga's non-response as a plea of not guilty. I will enter a plea of not guilty in, according, in accordance with the rules as you suggest. The judge also ordered an assessment of Kabuga's health. He was in a position of authority. The former tea and coffee tycoon is charged with five counts of genocide. He's accused of operating a hate speech radio station which fanned the flames of ethnic hatred against people identified as Tutsis during the 1994 killings in Rwanda. To kill and harm persons. He's also accused of bankrolling and importing huge numbers of machetes for ethnic Hutu militias. He was arrested in May in France and transferred to a UN detention center in The Hague at the end of October. During French extradition hearings, Kabuga dismissed the accusations against him as lies. David Doyle of Reuters with that report. The United Nations mission to Libya is condemning the killing of a lawyer and women's rights activist who was shot in her car in the east of the country. The organization says Hanan al-Barasi was brazenly shot in broad daylight in Benghazi by unidentified men. Barasi, 46, was a well-known figure in the media and frequently spoke out for female victims of violence in videos that she then broadcast on social media. She also ran a local women's rights group. Human Rights Watch has called for authorities in eastern Libya to swiftly investigate the apparent politically motivated killing of Barasi. 75 Libyan delegates gathered in Tunisia have agreed on a plan to hold elections for parliament and president within 18 months as part of a process to end a decade of violence and instability in the country. Acting United Nations Libya envoy Stephanie Williams is calling the development in Tunis a breakthrough and says, quote, there's real momentum and that's what we need to focus on and encourage. The delegates are also working to develop plans for a temporary government to prepare for elections and provide services. Two rival governments have battled for power, the internationally recognized government of national accord in Tripoli and the Libyan National Army allied with Eastern military leader Khalifa Haftar. Libya has been in a state of instability and unrest since the 2011 overthrow of longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi. Sudanese media says more than 200,000 Ethiopians are forecast to cross the border amid fighting and airstrikes in the Tigray region. Sisi Posikuya reports. More than 6,000 Ethiopians are reported to have entered Sudan, fleeing the fighting and airstrikes in their home country. Hundreds have died in clashes in the northern Tigray region, which bore Sudan and Eritrea. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has accused regional forces there, defiant of his authority of attacking the National Army. Citing Sudan's refugee agency, news agency Suna, said more than 200,000 were forecast to arrive from Ethiopia into the state of al Qadarif in the coming days. The report said camps would need to be set up at a safe distance from the border due to lack of basic services in the area. 
Meanwhile, outsiders have been barred from the area, communication lines are down, and several journalists have reportedly been arrested. With the status of the government offensive unclear, the United Nations and African Union have both called for a ceasefire amid fears that the nation of 110 million could slide into an ethnically charged civil war. So far, Abiy has ignored pleas for mediation. Sisipo of Rogers with that report. In Addis Ababa, police say a man lost his leg in an explosion under a bridge Wednesday but there was no immediate indication the incident was related to the conflict in the northern Tigri region. Rags were seen lying in a stream near the bridge, which was closed off after the explosion, but later reopened by authorities. One witness at the scene says the injured man had been planting devices when one went off. France and Germany are calling for much stronger external border security following the recent terror attacks in Europe. Experts say, however, that such measures alone are unlikely to solve the problem, as Henry Rijo reports. The spate of attacks began in Paris on October 16th, when teacher Samuel Patti was beheaded by Chechen teenager Abdullak Anzarov. Less than two weeks later, a Tunisian man fatally stabbed three people in a church in the French city of Nice. He had arrived from Tunisia as a migrant via Italy. And on November 2nd, Islamic State sympathizer Kuchtim Pejulai shot and killed four people in Vienna. The leaders of those countries, along with other European heads of state and officials, met Tuesday to discuss their response. France and Germany called for much tighter security on the border of Europe's passport-free travel area, known as the Schengen area. It's not about reducing or cutting down the right to asylum, but it's clearly about implementing it fully and fighting the pathways to misappropriate it and to better protect our common exterior borders. The terrorists in both Nice and Vienna had moved freely between Schengen countries. Securing the external border won't necessarily solve the problem, says terror analyst Raffaello Pantucci. As we've seen repeatedly in the past, you know, terror attacks tend to come from within. Um, and I think the last incident we saw in Austria was another example of this in many ways. While the individual involved may be a, a second generation immigrant, he was actually born in Austria. So how should governments tackle the threat of homegrown radicalization? Europe is proposing new laws to crack down on Internet companies hosting extremist content. The moment they are given evidence that there is something on their sites that is criminal or damaging, they have to react straight away and quickly. The EU meeting took place on the fifth anniversary of the coordinated terror attacks in Paris when nine attackers killed 130 people. Since then, most attacks in Europe have been carried out by so-called lone wolf terrorists. It's an infinitely better place to be than seeing large-scale attacks like we saw in Paris or Madrid or London earlier these decades. The 27 European Union heads of state are due to meet again in December to decide concrete steps on tackling the terror threat. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Ghana's women-only trucking company, Ladybird Logistics, has seen its fleet of trucks quadruple in two years and the number of its drivers triple. Stacey Knott reports from Takoradi, Ghana. Iram Sador is proud to be one of the first women to join Ladybird Logistics, a trucking firm in Ghana that claims to be the world's first to hire only female drivers. She also loves seeing newly recruited ladies get behind the wheel. The company is developing, yeah, because we start with uh, 11 drivers. We are the first badge and now Everything is proving, improving well, yeah. We are, more drivers are coming, more cars are coming. Since starting in 2017, the company has grown from five trucks in 2018 to 20 trucks today, with 35 women drivers and 14 more in training. While some of Ghana's male truckers encourage them, the company says others don't want to see women in the profession. The guys thought this wouldn't be possible. And they were thinking maybe the trucks, the, the women will be smashing the trucks here and there. 
after three years down the line, we are still going and we are growing. Ladybird drivers say the work is empowering and shows the importance of giving women equal opportunities. You can recruit only men. We've got families to feed. And what if um, my husband is the only person who brings income and then he's sick? So I bring income, he also brings income. It helps the society, it helps the country. Women take care. When you educate a woman, you know you educate a country. SNM Nyairo has been pushing Ghana's woman to get into commercial driving. She started out in Accra as a taxi driver, also a job dominated by men. Now she trains women to drive trucks and buses and has seen increasing support from Ghanaian men. When you have fathers, brothers, uncles talking to you and asking how they could get their their nieces, their daughters and their grandchildren into the profession, it tells you society has been listening. Nyado and Ladybird Logistics say they will continue steering more women into the profession. Stacey Knott for VOA News, Takradi, Ghana. Sari Kumalo, the first black African woman to conquer Mount Everest, appears to have set a Guinness World Record for the most money raised during an eight-hour stationary cycling fundraiser. As Banco Puglisi reports from Johannesburg, she will use the money to build digital libraries for rural children whose education has been impacted by COVID-19. From the highest peak of Mount Everest to a stationary bicycle, South African Sarah Kumalo is breaking new records. The first black African woman to summit the world's tallest mountain in 2019, Kumalo gave herself a new challenge, breaking a Guinness World Record for charity. Through eight hours of stationary cycling, Kumalo raised nearly 44,000 US dollars to build digital libraries for South Africa's rural students whose education suffered when schools closed from the pandemic. I think we can't afford to leave any children behind. If you look at what happened with the lockdown and, and COVID-19, schools that did not have digital um, material to support their students were really locked down. Students were struggling um, and we can't afford that. Each digital library will have a mobile tablet computer with curriculum based application in teacher trained modules. Education aid group iSchool Africa helped fundraise for Kumalo and her team attempt to break the Guinness World Record. We worked to, in partnership with the schools, with donors, with sponsors to really change the way we teach and learn and to look for solutions in a very challenging environment. After eight hours of cycling, Kumalo and her team were confident it was an awesome, awesome, awesome day and um, at about around one o'clock uh, Sarah and I knew that we had, um, we had uh, broken the world record which was what it was all about because it's for the children, it's for the children of this beautiful country. While falling short of a personal goal to raise about 62,000 US dollars, Kumalo says she will keep fundraising until they reach the peak of their goal to build nine digital libraries for South African children. Franco Puglisi for VOA News, Johannesburg. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a young Malian poet defies stereotypes in his conservative West African nation. We'll be right back.
is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on BOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. U.S. President Donald Trump's campaign launched a new legal effort this week aimed at stopping the certification of election results in Pennsylvania as the president continued to refuse to concede to President-elect Joe Biden. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has the latest. On Veterans Day in the United States, President Donald Trump laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National while President-elect Joe Biden visited the Delphia Korean War Memorial. Neither man gave remarks. Trump refuses to concede after last week's presidential election showed Biden to be the projected winner. The president declared on Twitter that we will win. With the state of Alaska being called for Trump, he now has 217 electoral votes, while Biden has 279. A candidate needs a minimum of 270 to win. Three states have not yet been called, Arizona, Georgia, and North Carolina. On top of various legal challenges already filed in several battleground states claiming voter fraud, the Trump campaign has launched a new lawsuit aiming to block certification of the election results in Pennsylvania. It is possible uh, that if they kick up enough dust uh, and uh, enough uh, allegations and uncertainty um, that they could potentially convince uh, Republican-controlled legislatures uh, to uh, seat a rival slate of electors um, that are opposite of what the votes in the state uh, and the voters in the state called for, um, that would be an extraordinarily extreme step. It would really be a coup against the American people uh, and a destruction of the democratic process. Meanwhile, two states are headed for a recount, Wisconsin and Georgia. With the margin being so close, it will require a full by-hand recount in each county. This will help build confidence. It will be an audit, a recount, and a re-canvas all at once. The Trump campaign celebrated the announcement with campaign communications director Tim Murtaugh saying, this is an important first step in the process to ensure that the election was fair and that every legal vote was counted. So far, none of the legal challenges mounted by the Trump campaign has succeeded in providing evidence for their claim of ballot count fraud, something Democrats are eager to point out. We are a week out and the president is still desperately searching for evidence of fraud. He won't find it because it doesn't exist. Even if Trump is successful in some of his lawsuits and recount demands, analysts say it's unlikely to overturn Biden's victory. But it does appear reasonable what the media, both the left-leaning and right-leaning media, have concluded that it is impossible for Trump to make up the deficit he now faces in key states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada. By law, state electors have to formally cast their votes for president and vice president in mid-December. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. Mali, known for its music and cultural events, attracted artists from across West Africa to this year's annual Slam Poetry Festival. Annie Reisenberg followed one young Malian poet 
who is barking stereotypes in the conservative nation in this report from Bamako. Aisha Diara first learned of slam poetry when her high school held a competition. Now, she's been a slam poet since 2015 and takes part in Mali's annual slam poetry festival. The poets, like Diara, perform spoken word poetry in front of an audience and judges. She sees her art as a form of activism, meant to highlight the lives of Malian women and girls. The subjects that I talk about, often people think that they're too bold. When I talk about circumcision of young girls, it's generally a taboo subject in Africa. They think it's too bold, but others congratulate me because there are many who do not dare to venture there. Slam poetry is a relatively new music scene in Mali. A country with deep musical and oral traditions, Mali is regarded as a musical crossroads in Africa. Slam first appeared in Mali in 2006, years after it gained popularity in the United States. The slam poets for us, they are full-fledged musicians. We accept them as being musicians. This year, the festival was held in November, months later than usual, due to the coronavirus and a curfew imposed after a coup d'etat in August. Diara performed on stage for the first time in nearly a year. I have joy in my heart. It's like a child who could walk, and suddenly he fell ill and couldn't walk. Later, the doctor tells him that he will walk again. You can imagine the joy. So I have this joy. The annual festival is run by a Malian organization called Agratoire, founded by one of Mali's first slam poets, Aziz Kone. As you know, everyone knows it. Since 2012, Mali has been weakened by a security crisis, by a social crisis. So we saw that it's important for us today to hold this festival in the name of peace and social cohesion. This year saw Mali struggling with both regional instability and a worldwide pandemic, which left cultural activities in the normally music scene in shambles. But slam poetry continues to attract young Malians committed to a better future for their country. Annie Reisenberg for VOA News, Mako Mali. From a child of immigrants drawing on the walls of the family's house to an Emmy-winning visual effects artist drawing for Hollywood, a Cambodian-American talent represents a classic success story of the American dream. Now she hopes to bring the dream to her motherland. Viewers Chetra Cha reports. Television hit in America like Gotham, Westworld, and Stranger Things, all major hits, and all include visual effects created by an Emmy-winning artist of Cambodian descent. This is what you get as a Cambodian when you have the proper resources and the support and the courage well, this is for the Cambodian people. This is to show courage and to show a voice that no matter where you are, where you come from, you can still be, you can still show your greatness. Based in Los Angeles, Cambodian-American Sina San says she's found inspiration in her culture. The Cambodian culture bleeds creativity. And, you, and, and when I spent some time really diving into the culture and looking at the architecture and looking at um, you know, the different styles from different decades and periods, and it was all very, very consistent. And every, every, every incarnation was a better version, not better, but it was just taking what was there and just enhancing it all the way up to you see Angkor Wat, which is very grand. As a child, she lived in a refugee camp in Thailand after her parents escaped the communist Khmer Rouge regime that killed 1.7 million in Cambodia in the 1970s. She arrived in America at three, and her parents say she shown a love for drawing early on. She stayed up all night drawing, and in the morning, she went to school. When she came back home, she continued drawing. Her mind was fixated on drawing. Even in high school, she kept drawing.
Then her father sit her down and ask, "Is drawing what you want to pursue? Are you sure?" She answered, "Yes." He immediately took her to get four hundred dollars worth of art supplies. San won a scholarship to study computer animation at the Art Institute of California in Los Angeles. She has now been producing animation and visual effects for video games, Hollywood films, and television shows for two decades. These days, San recalls how artists and educated people in Cambodia were once executed, and worries that has taken a toll on her culture. Only as I got older was when it started to affect me. When I realized, my goodness, it's You know, it's been quite some time since uh, since the uh, the killing fields, yes. And we we haven't made big, huge strides in the creative arts itself. Uh, we realize that we have to do something. We we want to do something. I've been inspired by Hollywood, so I'm bringing Hollywood home. Sina San recently quit her job in Hollywood to start her own company. She said her team wants to inspire creativity in Cambodia and create a sustainable platform that Cambodian artists can collaborate and create. I just met with VOA this morning, and we. we Chatra Chap for VOA News, Los Angeles. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.